Hello dear viewers, here is a new video that I will please you on my channel Manwa Compilation. I hope you like my story and how I told it to you. Once upon a time, a renowned blacksmith operated a workshop where he sold his meticulously crafted ironworks. One fateful day, luck smiled upon him as he secured a deal to supply his creations to the Cairo Kingdom. This presented an incredible opportunity for him to elevate his social standing, considering the looming prospect of an interminable conflict. Following the cessation of hostilities, the blacksmith was ennobled as a baron, and subsequently became the lord of the realm. Observing this tale with keen interest was the blacksmith's eldest son, while behind them, the young master's attendant questioned the purpose of listening to a narrative he was already well acquainted with. The origins of this unusual situation traced back a few hours earlier, when the servant discovered that he was the firstborn son of the Dimitri family, raised within the confines of the kingdom of Cairo. He could only nod affirmatively when his young master vocally acknowledged this revelation. Puzzlement shrouded his thoughts, wondering if his master's utterance of such explicit facts was a consequence of some altered state of mind. Attempting to divert the discourse, he then informed his master about the impending visit of Lady Lawrence, his fiancée. However, Dimitri, the young master, seemed lost in contemplation. Abruptly, Dimitri directed his servant to cancel the visits, and expressed a desire to meet the eldest person in the county for a comprehensive understanding of its affairs, further perplexing his attendant. Returning to the present moment, the elder concluded his narrative, and the young master rewarded him for his contribution. Subsequently, the young master sat in silence, deliberating on his options. It was revealed that his name was Beak Young Heck, and in a previous incarnation, he had been a heavenly demon. Having fulfilled all his life's responsibilities, he had accepted his own demise. However, for inexplicable reasons, he had awakened in the body of Roman Dimitri. As they contemplated this enigmatic turn of events, their attention was drawn to a group of individuals assaulting someone. A red-haired youth bore the brunt of their brutality as three men loomed menacingly over him, blood staining his face. The perpetrator who had kicked him started subjecting him to humiliation, eliciting laughter from the others. The trio continued their assault on the defenseless youth who made futile attempts at self-defense. Meanwhile, the attendant, known as Hans, moved closer to observe the situation. It was then that he noticed a tattoo on one of the assailants. To his surprise, Roman had positioned himself next to Hans. Roman identified them as members of the Bloodfang, a group involved in moneylending and various enterprises within Dimitri and nearby regions. Servant couldn't help but notice that Roman was no longer with him. Roman approached the group and implored them to cease their assault on the boy. As he neared the gang, one of the members recognized him. The gang derided Roman and insisted that he depart, citing that the situation was none of his concern. Hans, concerned for Roman's safety, urged him to leave, emphasizing the danger posed by the gang. Roman, however, interrupted Hans, inquiring about the local laws, which he was unfamiliar with. He sought to determine the transgressions and appropriate punishments. Hans explained that the youth was in the wrong for failing to repay a debt on time. Importantly, Bloodfang had no authority to administer any punitive measures. Moreover, their maltreatment of the eldest son of the Dimitri family constituted a grave offense, punishable by death. Roman, now holding a stick retrieved from the ground, informed the gang that he was the eldest son of Lord Romero Dimitri, and he intended to administer justice. The gang's leader taunted Roman and prepared to engage him. Roman wore a sardonic smile, leaving the gang leader perplexed. As Roman took a determined stride forward, he confronted the man for their disrespectful behavior towards the leader of this territory, bluntly labeling them as troublemakers who didn't warrant his curiosity. With swift agility, he charged at the man. The gang members readied themselves, drawing their swords, and their leader clenched his teeth while raising his blade. In an attempted swing at Roman, the leader found himself outmatched, as Roman's superior speed allowed him to strike first, ending the leader's life in a single blow. Roman then menacingly thrust his wooden rod through the defeated leader's neck, sending shivers down the spines of the remaining gang members. Despite their fear, they pressed forward, intending to avenge their fallen leader causing Hans to worry deeply for Roman's safety. One of the gang members swung his sword at Roman, who skillfully evaded the attack, narrowly avoiding a fatal blow to his face. Roman retaliated swiftly, delivering a powerful punch that incapacitated his assailant. As one gang member fell to the ground, 
Clutching his chest in agony, Roman reflected upon the eerie vision he had seen when he had first awakened as Roman. It was a testament to Roman's commitment, now reduced to a pile of drugs on the floor. Reading the contents, he discovered that the real Roman had been drafted into serving his family in the army, a revelation that had driven him to take his own life. As Roman prepared to confront the remaining gang members, he couldn't help but contemplate the tragic life the real Roman had endured. Nevertheless, this body now belonged to byung Hook, the leader of the Heavenly Demon Cult. Surveying the blood-soaked scene before him, he resolved to live his new life in the manner of byung Hook, vowing to rule Muram with an iron fist. He turned around to face the person who had called him a monster, the last surviving gang member, who trembled in fear at the sight of Roman among the fallen. Before the man could make a desperate escape, Roman caught up to him. The man pleaded with Roman for mercy, but Roman compelled him to kneel, raising his sword. Roman stressed the importance of upholding the law for a society to function properly, and although he did not need to take the man's life, he must face the consequences for his reckless words. The man shuddered as Roman quickly ended his life, slitting his throat, his eyes widening in horror as he clutched his neck. People recoiled in fear as they witnessed the gruesome spectacle, and Roman asserted that anyone dissatisfied with his judgment could seek him out at any time. In his previous life, he had been byung Hook, ascending to the pinnacle of power through his unparalleled strength and ruthlessly slaughtering any challengers. The rivers of blood that flowed bore witness to the dominance of the heavenly demon cult over Muram. Now, as Roman observed his bloody hands, he realized the physical toll the fight had taken on his body. He promptly called Hans to summon the guards to clean up the street. As Hans hurried away, Roman pondered the futility of this body and the turbulent wake it had left behind. Roman resolved to gather information swiftly and undergo skeletal metamorphosis to strengthen his new vessel. Suddenly, the boy he had rescued earlier, named Kevin, expressed his gratitude to Roman. Roman responded by explaining that he had administered punishment for breaking the law, sparing no one, himself included. He then issued a stern threat, warning Kevin to tell the truth or face severe consequences. Kevin hesitated briefly before confessing that his parents had borrowed money from the Bloodfang to purchase land for farming. They had planned to repay the debt with the proceeds from their crops, but the Bloodfang had destroyed their harvest. In a cruel twist, they demanded Kevin's younger sister as payment. Frustrated by their misfortunes, Kevin lamented the unjust hand that fate had dealt them, begging Roman to save his sister due to their inability to meet the debt. Roman contemplated Kevin's plea, sensing that he was dealing with one of the four heavens' kings, a formidable and enigmatic figure. As Roman gazed at the sky, he recollected a previous encounter with a similarly deranged demon in a desolate place. He inquired about Kevin's name, and Kevin introduced himself before departing. Roman assured Kevin that he would verify the truth of his story and resolve the day's events. Grateful, Kevin thanked Roman and disappeared into the distance, leaving Roman with a sense that their paths might cross again in the future. Meanwhile, the carriage wheels continued their rhythmic rotation as Lady Flora received news that they would soon reach Dimitri's territory. Lady Flora, sitting quietly inside the carriage, reflected on the political marriage her father had arranged with the Dimitri family a month prior. Her father had explained that their land was in dire need of assistance, prompting the union. Unhappy with this arrangement, Flora resented the prospect of marrying into the Dimitri family, whom she perceived as mere minors. Her attempts to protest were met with her father's insistence and apologies, claiming he had no alternative. In the present moment, her servant informed her of their arrival. As she was assisted out of the carriage, Flora contemplated her impending marriage to the Dimitri family's second son, a young man with a promising future. Unexpectedly, Roman had expressed a desire to marry her, and they had crossed paths upon her entrance to the palace. Sensing his presence, she turned immediately, unable to meet Roman's gaze due to his reputation as the reckless and pleasure-seeking member of the Dimitri family. As they engaged in a private conversation, Flora mustered the courage to express her reluctance towards the political marriage, believing it was not in her best interest. To her astonishment, Roman promptly agreed with her sentiments. Flora was taken aback by his response. Roman went further, stating that the Dimitri family was not a suitable match for her and that the wedding should be cancelled. Flora struggled to process the turn of events, prompting Roman to declare his intention to convey this decision to his father, emphasizing its importance. However, 
She intervened, questioning Roman's sudden change of heart. Roman turned to her, inquiring whether she truly wished to marry him, to which she hesitantly declined. Roman then resolved to take responsibility for ending the engagement, unflinchingly accepting the prospect of being labeled a divorced man, as he was already known as a member of the Dimitri family. Flora remained speechless as she watched Roman depart, the double doors closing behind him. He promptly informed his father of his desire to dissolve the marriage arrangement with Lady Flora. Romero, his father, grew infuriated, asserting that joining the Lawrence family through marriage was the only way to secure their noble status. Roman, however, quietly offered his apologies. This incensed his father to the point where he impulsively hurled a glass toward Roman's head. He then informed Roman that if the wedding proceeded as planned, he would handle Roman's military service obligations. However, with the wedding cancelled, Roman would now have to spend six months on the battlefield. Roman, finding himself unable to retort, kept silent in his father's presence. His father was already displeased upon discovering that Roman had incurred trouble with the blood fang. He insisted that Roman rectify the situation himself, assuming that Roman would eventually beg for mercy. To Romero's surprise, Roman, with blood trickling down his face, expressed his intention to resolve the issue independently, considering himself responsible for its escalation. He assured Romero that he would return once everything was sorted and departed before Romero could utter a word. Outside, Roman retrieved a cloth from his pocket to wipe away the blood. Just as someone called him crazy, Roman opened his eyes to find Flora standing before him. He asked why she was still here, to which Flora replied that the Blood Fang was a dangerous group that wasn't afraid to threaten even. Labeling them as trouble might provoke retaliation, and without the family's support, Roman would be powerless. Roman dismissed her advice, branding her presumptuous, much to her displeasure. A few hours earlier, Roman had complained about the tight collar of his attire, worn out of respect for his fiancée, Flora, even though he was coughing and had been doused with perfume due to the scent of blood. He had reservations about marriage, anticipating more problems in a world he was just getting used to. As they prepared to descend, he realized Hans was right. He couldn't be impolite to a woman who hadn't wronged him. His plan was to cancel the wedding without hurting Flora's feelings. However, their conversation revealed that Flora had no intentions of showing him any respect, leading him to perceive her as arrogant. He also deduced that she hadn't considered him when deciding to call off the wedding. When Flora attempted to respond, Roman silenced her, stating that she had no say in his choices once the wedding was cancelled. Flora stood there, unable to retort, and Roman announced they would part ways and attend to their own matters. He harbored no desire to assume responsibility. He wanted to avoid any further discussion of marriage and had no intention of dealing with her again. This marked their first and last meeting. Later that night, Rihanna, Romero's wife, urged him to stop drinking just as he was about to take another swig. Romero confided in Rihanna about everything that had transpired, including breaking his pledge to refrain from violence against Roman. She consoled him, emphasizing that this very pledge had spared their child from hardship. However, Romero felt adrift as Roman had been the only one to endure those trying times with him. Rihanna embraced him and implored him not to blame himself for being an inadequate father. She also expressed her concern for Roman's safety, fearing that his conflict with the Blood Fang Gang would lead to his demise. Romero summoned the guard by the door and instructed him to contact Captain Jonathan immediately. The following day, Roman strolled freely through the streets, with Hans anxiously trailing behind him. Hans urged Roman to return, cautioning that the blood fang might seek retribution. Roman paid little heed, and instead inquired when the gang had gained such power. Hans couldn't provide an answer. Roman noted that the blood fang had earned notoriety by brutally eliminating their rivals during territorial disputes. Hans remained concerned about the gang's ongoing danger. But Roman decided to lure them out, and chose to visit an old restaurant called Atelier, bustling with patrons, and bustling waitstaff carrying trays of beer. Once inside, they ordered an array of dishes, surprising Hans with their delectable appearance. Roman instructed Hans to eat while he conducted his investigation, as it was too risky for Hans to continue shadowing him. Hans insisted on staying by Roman's side, even if it put him in peril. Roman gazed into Hans's eyes and asked if Hans was on his side, to which Hans affirmed his loyalty. In the end, Roman gave Hans an order, not to follow him and consider his duty complete merely by accompanying him outside. 
Hans felt helpless but watched as his master departed, unable to intervene. Meanwhile, Roman contemplated the blood fang as he walked through the streets, feeling vulnerable in smaller groups, making them challenging to apprehend. Surveying the tranquil neighborhood, he surmised that their survival stemmed from the potential public outrage if they weren't entirely eradicated. Roman knew he had to bait them, and now that he was alone without Hans, he anticipated the Blood Fang's imminent attack due to the reduced street security, thanks to the regular training of the Dimitri Knights. Deliberately, he ventured into a secluded alley. Soon, someone approached him from behind, readying a knife. One of the three men trailing Roman called out to him just as the attacker lunged with his blade. Roman stood silently until he heard his name. Captain Jonathan turned to see Hans sprinting toward him. Hans rushed up and urgently informed him of Roman's danger. True to his word, Roman grappled with his assailant, landing a devastating blow to the gut with his elbow. The assailant seethed but was powerless when Roman broke his wrist, causing the knife to slip from his hands. Roman swiftly caught the falling weapon with his left hand and used it to strike the man's neck. Blood splattered as the man staggered back, clutching his neck in agony. The other two onlookers were shocked, unable to fathom what had just transpired. Roman grinned with a hint of amusement as he observed the fear etched across their faces. Slowly, he continued to provoke them, his knife glistening menacingly in his grip. When Captain Jonathan reiterated Hans's claim about Roman venturing to the city alone to confront the notorious Blood Fang without any protection, it left everyone perplexed. Yet, Hans managed to persuade them that it was indeed the truth. However, raucous laughter erupted as they contemplated the idea of Roman, seemingly the frailest among them, embarking on this perilous mission. Hans, though, silenced their mirth and passionately argued in favor of his story's authenticity. Captain Jonathan found himself ruminating on the previous night when he had been tasked by the Lord to mediate the dispute between Roman and the Blood Fang. He sighed, contemplating the trouble Roman always seemed to bring. Roman was no warrior, lacking any proficiency with weaponry. Swiftly, he ordered his soldiers to prepare for action. Turning to Hans, he instructed him to lead the way to Roman's location, emphasizing that on their territory, no one dared lay a finger on the young master of Dimitri. As he pondered the potential dire consequences for Roman, if Hans's account held true, they set off. Meanwhile, at the spot where Roman had goaded them into attacking, his adversaries brandished their knives and charged toward him with murderous intent. Intent on taking his life, they closed in, but Roman stood unperturbed. Dodging a strike aimed at his left side, he swiftly countered, his knife finding its mark. The final assailant, infuriated by the unfolding events, hurled curses at Roman and lunged from above. However, Roman anticipated the move and delivered a forceful gut kick, sending the aggressor crashing to the ground with a resounding thud. Kneeling before him, Roman inquired if there were only three of them, prompting the wounded man to cautiously retreat, his face contorted in pain. Leaning in, Roman confronted him, knowing his attempt at intimidation was feeble. He raised his knife menacingly, urging the man to answer his questions precisely. With a swift stab to the leg as a warning, the man's agonized screams filled the air as he divulged their leader's identity. Later, in a bustling street, a tavern bearing the emblem of the sun and mountains drew attention. The establishment buzzed with lively conversations, and as Roman entered, he didn't escape notice, especially in his blood-stained attire. The bartender's surprise at his presence was palpable, acknowledging him with the deference due to a young master. Positioned at the bar, Roman became the subject of hushed whispers. Inquiring about his preference, the bartender inquired about his order. Roman requested the 27-year-old Tears of Dawn, but upon discovering it wasn't available, he welcomed an alternative. He sought something potent to brace himself for the tasks awaiting him the following morning all while remembering a cryptic conversation with one of his assailants regarding the Dew of Dawn. This obscure tavern held a clue to their mission, requiring a specific code for entry. Roman probed the bartender for the code, which involved the keywords Tears of Dawn, Strong, and Morning, to be arranged correctly. The tavern fell into an eerie hush as the bartender, concealing a knife under the counter, signaled for everyone to attack Roman. However, Roman's reflexes allowed him to strike first, stunning the bald aggressor with a powerful blow. The patrons watched in shock as the man crumpled to the floor. Subsequently, the remaining patrons, some wielding swords, charged at Roman with lethal intent. 
Roman easily dispersed them, and then several patrons fled outside, urgently pleading for someone to call security. Doors splintered as some patrons were hurled against them. Roman slashed one man's throat and strangled another, all while positioned near a window. Witnessing Roman's transformation into a formidable adversary, the survivors hesitated and recoiled in fear. Roman released the man he had been choking, causing the others to rally in numbers. His martial arts prowess compensated for his physical limitations, and he wore a knowing smirk as he realized he could overcome them effortlessly. Eventually, the bartender regained consciousness, bewildered by the carnage around him. He pondered whether Roman was responsible for this bloodbath. A shout from above directed Captain Jonathan's attention to the scene, where one of his soldiers informed him that a survivor had divulged that the young master had departed for Lawrence. Jonathan was taken aback, wondering why Roman would venture there. It then came to light that Lawrence housed the Bloodfang's headquarters. An hour prior, Roman interrogated the tavern's owner, who was tied to a chair on the second floor. The bartender's anguished expression betrayed the pain he was enduring, having already lost two fingers. Roman implored him to spare another finger by divulging the information he sought. The bartender, however, remained defiant, cursing Roman and asserting that the Bloodfang would exact vengeance. Roman, his gaze wandering, noticed a photograph. He approached, retrieved it, and assessed the bartender's reaction. Curious whether anything could break the man's silence, Roman threatened to track down and kill the young boy depicted in the photograph, who bore a striking resemblance to the bartender. The bartender vehemently denied any connection. Roman, undeterred, observed that the Bloodfang's members often spiraled into criminality due to overwhelming debts, leading them to coerce families into servitude through illicit means. Roman emphasized that the bartender's family could meet a similar fate. The bartender condemned Roman for exploiting his noble lineage to threaten his family, but Roman remained unyielding, intrigued by the Blood Fang's unwavering resolve for revenge. In the midst of their tense exchange, the bartender attempted to free himself from the chair. Frozen in place, he listened as Roman expounded on how many Blood Fang members had incurred substantial debts and resorted to criminal activities to settle them. Roman questioned whether the bartender believed this cycle could ever be broken. He refused to consider the possibility, convinced that the Blood Fang would invariably seek retribution. Roman challenged him to rethink his stance, asserting that he wouldn't hesitate to harm his son, punctuating his declaration by shattering the photograph. When Roman gazed down at the shattered picture, he vowed to make the soldiers track down his son and end his life. The bartender's eyes welled up as he regarded Roman, offering him another opportunity to provide the information he needed about Bloodfang. Meanwhile, over in Lawrence, the leader of Bloodfang seethed with anger upon hearing that Roman Dimitri had triumphed over their entire faction. The Dimitri knights began to mobilize. The leader clenched his teeth and pounded his armrest in frustration. He had never imagined Roman capable of such a feat. After witnessing Roman dismantle an entire branch of his operation, he reconsidered his plan to punish Roman. It was imperative to locate Roman, and one of his members reported that Roman had barely left Dimitri's territory. Roman had also acquired his intelligence from the Dew of Dawn. The leader interpreted Roman's actions as a mockery, attacking their headquarters single-handedly. Thus, he issued orders for all their forces to converge and eliminate Roman. He resolved to kill Roman and display his lifeless body in the square, thereby restoring Bloodfang's fearsome reputation. Meanwhile, within the castle, Flora's father was engrossed in a meeting. They discussed how the Barcos family had taken out significant loans from the gold bank to arm themselves for the impending war, emphasizing the urgency for their side to do the same. Deep in thought, he concluded that war was now inevitable, a realization he had never anticipated until the Barcos presented him with a document. One member suggested that if the central government sided with the Barcos, they might eventually concede their land. However, Another argued passionately that they must retain their land at all costs, as it was the most fertile in the country. A heated debate ensued at the table regarding an old agreement between the Lawrences and the Barcos. Flora's father intervened, silencing the discussion. He emphasized that they could not relinquish their land, as families from all over the country would vie for it. Given the Barcos's unwillingness to yield, he insisted they must fight with all their might. Consequently, he arranged a marriage with Dimitri. The atmosphere at the table improved considerably, knowing that the Dimitri family was one of the wealthiest in the Northeast. 
Regardless of the Barcos's substantial bank loans, they still couldn't match the wealth of the Dimitri family. One member reassured the Lord that sending Flora to Dimitri was indeed the right decision, and he concurred. Meanwhile, just outside the door, Flora overheard the entire conversation, realizing she needed to convey that the marriage was now cancelled. Anxious and torn, she paced in front of the door, contemplating how to break the news to her father and the implications for their family's future. Ultimately, she resolved that she couldn't marry someone she didn't love. In that moment, a guard approached her from behind, calling for the Lord's attention. Flora was taken aback as the guard extended his respects to her before opening the door and alerting the people inside of an emergency. Flora couldn't help but wonder what could be transpiring. The emergency, as it turned out, was a group of Dimitri knights knocking at their door, searching for Roman. While the captain insisted on adhering to regulations and dropping their weapons, Captain Jonathan attempted to intimidate them by warning that there would be consequences if anything happened to Roman. Another guard from inside reported to his captain that Lawrence Plaza had been ransacked. Captain Jonathan, overhearing this, grew concerned for Roman's safety. Meanwhile in the plaza, onlookers watched in horror as someone was dragged across the square, leaving a trail of blood behind. To their shock, it was Roman who was dragging the Bloodfang leader, Ben Miles, who was bleeding from one eye and covered in bruises, begging for mercy. Roman had earlier infiltrated Bloodfang's Lawrence headquarters, where the gang was already armed and prepared for a fight. When the door creaked open loudly, the Bloodfang leader, initially cocky and confident, found himself on his knees, surrounded by his dead comrades sprawled across the bloody floor. Fear gripped him as he looked up to see Roman moving among the lifeless bodies. Despite his reluctance to die, his thoughts turned to his impending demise. In the end, he pleaded with Roman to spare his life. With a swift kick to the head, Roman silenced Ben's pleas, the impact resonating with a loud thud as his head struck the unforgiving concrete. Roman then addressed the plaza's spectators, proclaiming Ben as the Bloodfang leader. Roman didn't hold back his words, even with a child in the audience. He accused Bloodfang of terrorizing the community, and with a menacing gaze declared that Bloodfang's crimes were evident, so he would execute Ben before the people of Lawrence. With a final kick to Ben's head, Roman ended his life, leaving the bystanders astonished at the brutality of the execution. At the same time, Captain Jonathan arrived, witnessing the brutal spectacle. Back in the castle, a guard informed the Lord that Roman Dimitri had entered Lawrence due to his engagement to Flora. However, an hour later, he arrived at Lawrence Plaza with a man in tow. The guard reported that Roman had claimed the man he brought was the leader of Blood Fang, and had executed him before the crowd. The entire assembly at the table, including Flora's father, was shocked to learn that Roman had executed the Blood Fang leader. The discussion at the table escalated, with one member noting that Roman had taken a life without the Lord's approval. The Lord ordered them to summon Roman as he wanted to hear the account directly from him. After a while, Roman and Jonathan met with the Lord. The members assumed that Roman had defeated Bloodfang with Captain Jonathan's assistance. Roman greeted Sips Count Lawrence, but the Lord urged him to skip the formalities and provide a full account. Roman proceeded to recount everything, including the Bloodfang's attack on an innocent Dimitri resident, leading to their swift elimination. In the meantime, Flora observed the door with keen interest. Upon spotting a guard, she beckoned him over, eager to inquire why Roman had visited his father's office. The guard promptly filled Lady Flora in on all the office proceedings. Roman had confessed to Lord Romero that he couldn't abandon them, prompting him to launch an assault on their base and eliminate their leader. Roman vividly recalled the chaotic Dew of Dawn incident, where people had scattered in fear. He had then questioned the morality of his actions with the Lord, who, instead of answering, had inquired about Ben to his advisor. The advisor acknowledged Ben's notoriety, but never suspected him as the Bloodfang leader. Ultimately, the Lord considered the matter closed, partly blaming Lawrence for not taking it seriously. He assured Roman of future rewards and granted him permission to depart. Roman and Jonathan bowed respectfully before exiting. As Roman departed, the Lord's laughter echoed through the room, leaving his advisor baffled as he reclined in his chair. The Lord found Roman's character intriguing and was pleased that Roman would become Flora's husband. He promptly instructed a servant to summon Flora without delay. In the afternoon, 
Roman journeyed back to Dimitri with Jonathan and his accompanying soldiers. The rhythmic clatter of horseshoes resonated in the otherwise quiet surroundings. Observing Roman from the rear of his horse, Jonathan couldn't help but inquire about Roman's provocation of the Lord. Roman, leading the way, explained that Lawrence shared some blame and that he aimed to demonstrate their responsibility. He also clarified that the Lord was unaware of the marriage cancellation, so he wouldn't punish his daughter's fiancé, a revelation that left Jonathan surprised. As Jonathan trailed Roman, he pondered the enigmatic transformation he had witnessed in Roman. He was no longer the young master he had once known. Upon their arrival in Dimitri, Roman found himself lost in reminiscence about his past life. He had been Beak Young Hook, the heavenly demon's son, cast into an underground cave by his father to prove his worthiness for the throne. His father had stated that if he perished, he could simply father more children. But if he truly were his son, he had to assert his dominance over everyone in the cave. This unfamiliar world had thrown him into a brutal existence where only the strongest survived. During his childhood he had endured relentless beatings from other demon children for being weak, with the leader subjecting him to merciless punches and scorn. His early life had been marked by hardship, a constant struggle for survival in a harsh environment. Later that evening, within Castle Roman, he indulged in a bath, his body showing signs of fatigue from its rapid deterioration. As he lay in the bath, he contemplated the choices he had made since awakening in this world. Gazing at his right hand, he acknowledged that most of his actions had been driven by blood fang. He was young Huck, trapped within Roman's body, and his path had been marked by ruthless elimination of obstacles. However, he recognized the dangers of such a path, as his powers waned over time. Roman pondered his future course of action, when he received word that Lord Romero wished to see him in his office. Jonathan recounted the events in Lawrence to Romero, who acknowledged that Roman was the least impressive of his children. As Romero stared at his right hand, he remembered Roman's kindness during his days as a commoner, when Roman would offer him candy despite the dangers of the mine. Despite his warnings, young Roman's generosity had touched Romero, who had reciprocated with a generous allowance. Romero had never anticipated that this kindness would lead Roman astray. He clenched his fist, remembering the consequences of his actions. While Romero had initially given up on Roman, he now cherished the changes he saw in him and his triumph over Bloodfang. Suddenly, Roman arrived, and Romero invited him into his office, eager to make amends for being an inadequate father and willing to do anything for his son. Roman's face remained devoid of emotion as he entered the room. Romero clasped his hands together and addressed his son. As their eyes met, Romero inquired whether Roman had defeated Bloodfang single-handedly. Roman weighed his response carefully, aware that telling the truth could have consequences and provide him with time to grow. Lying might be the more prudent choice, but memories of his childhood and the relentless beatings he had endured spurred him to answer truthfully. He had once used a rock to defend himself when cornered, and the memory of that defiance remained strong. The following day, the castle's training field resounded with the clashing of wooden swords as soldiers honed their combat skills. Suddenly, a voice commanded them to halt and show respect for Lord Romero. Roman and Jonathan arrived at the field, prompting the soldiers to swiftly line up and bow in reverence. Among them, a guard named Chris was bewildered by Roman's presence on the training field. Jonathan announced an upcoming swordsmanship duel between Roman and himself, sending a wave of nervous anticipation through the soldiers, including Chris, who struggled to believe what he had just heard. Gazing at the silent Roman, he couldn't help but reflect on the conversation he had overheard between Roman and Lord Romero just an hour ago, where Roman had proudly claimed sole responsibility for defeating Bloodfang, surprising Lord Romero, who had sought to understand how it was accomplished. Roman cautiously admitted to Romero that he had been clandestinely honing his swordsmanship skills. Romero felt disheartened that Roman had concealed this from him, as he would have gladly supported him had he known. However, Roman explained that, for once, he wanted to achieve something independently after being pampered for a long time. In response to Romero's concern about facing Bloodfang alone, Roman reassured him that all he needed to do was to lure the leader, as he was familiar with their operations, and the group would crumble without their leader. Romero was incredulous that Roman had orchestrated the downfall of Bloodfang's leader. During Romero's impassioned speech, 
Roman argued that a group held together by threats and intimidation wouldn't risk their lives to save their leader if there was a chance to regain their freedom, which is precisely what had transpired. As Roman concluded his explanation, a silence fell over the room. Romero silently admired his son's achievement and then asked Roman for a favor. Roman stood tall as Romero requested him to demonstrate his swordsmanship skills. Romero was eager to witness how much his son had changed. Fast forwarding to the present, the atmosphere on the field grew somber as no one volunteered for the duel. Chris understood that there was little to gain from winning and much to lose if they were defeated. Jonathan contemplated sending an expert to ensure the prestige of the Knights, ultimately selecting Chris, the vice captain of the Dimitri Knights. Chris was taken aback as he didn't want to face Roman. His first encounter with Roman had occurred last year when he received a report of a drunken disturbance while patrolling the area. He couldn't believe what he saw when he arrived at the scene. The drunken troublemaker was none other than Roman Dimitri. Roman was behaving belligerently, smashing bottles, and intimidating the bar owners. He was inebriated, insulting the owners as lowlifes, and bossing them around. When the terrified owners hesitated to act, he even threw a glass bottle at them, fortunately missing his target. Chris approached Roman and tried to restrain him by grabbing his hand, but Roman slapped him, proclaiming that a lowly knight like Chris couldn't touch him. Chris knew the moment Roman struck him that he had never received any training in his life. When Roman attempted to push him away, Chris realized that Roman had less strength than an average adult man. Chris's opinion of Roman hadn't changed, and he was shocked when Jonathan instructed him to fight Roman. He tried to argue with Jonathan, but Jonathan's stern response made it clear that further disagreement was futile. Left with no other choice, Chris reluctantly agreed to duel Roman, and they faced each other in the arena. As Jonathan prepared to commence the fight, Chris attempted to intimidate Roman by declaring that he wouldn't hold back, regardless of his opponent. With his head held high, he declared his willingness to fight Roman if it was permitted. He doubted Roman's ability to defeat Bloodfang's leader on his own. Romero and Jonathan exchanged glances, and then Romero nodded. Roman simply chuckled when Romero turned to him. Chris was astonished that Roman had laughed at his challenge, and his anger began to simmer. Jonathan interpreted Roman's response as acceptance, instructing both combatants to prepare. Roman and Chris remained steadfast in their positions, locking eyes as Jonathan announced the start of the battle. The instant the battle commenced, Chris lunged at Roman, launching an attack, but Roman effortlessly parried his strikes. The onlookers, including Jonathan, were impressed by Chris's lightning-fast assault. On the opposite side, Jonathan and Chris were equally surprised when Roman effortlessly deflected the attacks. When Roman attempted a counterattack, Chris hastily retreated. Chris was curious about Roman's strength and poise as he saw Roman standing confidently, ready to defend himself. Nevertheless, Chris was determined to best Roman, so he launched another attack. Once again, Roman skillfully evaded Chris's strike by stepping to the left. Chris saw an opportunity to strike from behind, but Roman swiftly dropped to the ground, planning to attack Chris from below as he swung. Chris narrowly evaded Roman's sword, with a close shave for his hair. Chris was taken aback by Roman's rapid attack, and he hastily withdrew, almost tripping over his own feet. Upon reaching a safe distance, he collected himself, realizing how precarious the situation was. Meanwhile, Romero and Jonathan were equally astonished. Nothing had gone as expected, and the other soldiers were also taken aback. Chris grew increasingly agitated, narrowing his eyes at his opponent. He had underestimated Roman's abilities. Roman stood there unflinching, prepared to defend himself. As Chris's frustration mounted, he realized that Roman had no discernible weaknesses in his fighting style, causing him to doubt his own capabilities. However, he suppressed those doubts, knowing that the fight was far from over. Suddenly, Roman announced that the warm-up was over, leaving Chris and others wondering what he meant as they prepared to watch the ensuing confrontation. Roman declared that he would initiate his offensive, dashing toward Chris and launching a relentless assault. Chris was caught off guard and barely managed to defend himself as they engaged in close combat, their swords clashing in front of their faces. Chris was astonished by Roman's speed. Roman then stepped back, preparing for a powerful sword swing. Chris struggled to keep up with Roman's unrelenting barrage of strikes. Meanwhile, the soldiers watching from the sidelines were left speechless. Chris soon found himself overwhelmed by Roman's relentless assault, desperately seeking an opportunity to escape. Just when he thought he had a chance to retreat, Roman landed a blow to his chest. 
Chris realized he should have retreated when he had the chance, but he noticed something about Roman's stance. With both of Roman's hands holding the sword above his head, he had left a significant opening in his chest. Chris seized the opportunity to strike, but Roman deftly sidestepped his attack. Their eyes met, and Roman let out a chuckle. Chris attempted another strike, determined not to lose after seeing Roman's grin. He used his aura attack on Roman by channeling it into his sword, against Jonathan's orders. Chris's eyes glowed with red and blue, surrounded by sparks, as he delivered his one-star aura attack upon Roman. Roman was taken aback by the unexpected surge in power, and a deafening explosion filled the arena, shrouding it in a cloud of dust. Everyone stood in astonishment, attempting to comprehend the unfolding events. Meanwhile, Romero persistently attempted to beckon Roman, his countenance etched with concern. Roman let out a sigh before looking up, his expression turning somber. He swiftly assumed a defensive stance as the dust settled to evade the impending attack. Chris found himself flabbergasted by Roman's unscathed defense and his inability to anticipate Roman's countermove. In a split second, Chris was toppled, leaving everyone, including Romero and Jonathan, utterly speechless. In the ring, Roman stood as the sole unscathed combatant, while Chris lay unconscious on the ground. Roman gazed at Chris with a sense of curiosity. When Chris was initially promoted to the position of Vice Knight Captain, he engaged in a sparring match with Jonathan on the training grounds. Other soldiers spoke highly of him, considering how he had attained a two-star aura at such a young age. Chris and Jonathan charged towards each other, poised for combat, but Jonathan effortlessly evaded Chris's strikes. Meanwhile, rumors swirled about how Chris had achieved one-star status in just three and a half years and the extraordinary prowess of his swordsmanship. At the conclusion of their duel, Chris was exhausted as he knelt, gripping his sword. Jonathan decided to call it a day, yet Chris remained eager to continue, despite his labored breaths. As soon as he regained his strength, he implored Jonathan for further instruction. Jonathan silently commended Chris for his innate talent and unwavering work ethic, recognizing him as a prodigy. However, on this day, he had been bested by Roman, leaving Chris unconscious on the ground. While Chris remained unconscious, Romero and Jonathan conversed about how Roman had achieved mastery with a two-star aura. Jonathan believed that Roman's growth could not be explained by any other means. Romero, elated, beckoned Roman closer and applauded his achievement, inquiring about any reward Roman desired for himself. Roman smirked, and disclosed his intention to depart for a battlefield in six months. Romero swiftly deduced that Roman had no desire to join the army. However, to Romero's astonishment, Roman sought the authority to select his own companions for the impending battle. Romero extended an offer to reconcile his fractured marriage, but Roman remained resolute in his decision to go to the battlefield. Initially taken aback by his son's unwavering determination, Romero acquiesced to his request pledging support for Roman in all his endeavors. Roman smiled as he turned and cast his gaze upon Chris, still unconscious on the ground. The following day, Chris, his face bandaged, received an unexpected request from Jonathan to teach Aura to Roman, a directive that had come from Romero himself. Initially hesitant because Roman had still triumphed even with the use of Aura, Chris was swayed by Jonathan's proposition. Jonathan promised to divulge his entire secret for achieving three-star knight status, a tantalizing offer for Chris. Chris reluctantly agreed, his determination masked by gritted teeth, knowing he couldn't decline this opportunity and would have to collaborate with Roman to fulfill the task. He reminded Jonathan to keep his word. In Roman's private chamber as he changed his attire, Hans informed him of the rumors circulating throughout the castle about his training field duel. Hans expressed his delight at Roman's victory against a two-star Aura knight. While buttoning his shirt, Roman inquired if Hans possessed any knowledge about Aura. Unfortunately, Hans only knew that Aura involved harnessing mana. As Roman finished buttoning his shirt and gazed out the window, he contemplated how in this world, mana was referred to as Ki. He grasped that the display of power by Chris earlier had been the release of Ki. Roman pondered why their utilization of Ki differed from his previous knowledge. Bathed in moonlight, he couldn't quite grasp the remainder of the puzzle, but felt confident he would uncover it during the next day's training. Meanwhile, Chris experienced discomfort in his wound due to his excitement. The following day, Chris and Roman met for their training session on an open field. They stared at each other in silence until Roman let out a sigh, 
further unsettling Chris. Nevertheless, Chris steeled himself and proceeded to educate Roman about Aura, how it was intricately linked to the utilization of mana, particularly among warriors. He explained that, unlike magicians who concentrated their mana in one location, knights distributed it throughout their bodies. Emperor Alexandra, known as the forerunner of Aura, was the first to recognize that this approach could enhance its potency. Aura involved the release of mana all at once, spreading it throughout the body. Chris stressed that comprehending the origins of mana was not crucial, as only a select few could wield it. He explained that one in a thousand could become an Aura Knight, and one in ten thousand could become a magician. He remarked that although it had taken him about six months to sense mana, Roman's ability to do so within a year was above average. Roman instructed Chris to begin by attempting to sense mana, and Chris was initially inclined to view Roman as overly confident after their previous match. As Roman stood with arms crossed and a blank expression, Chris was determined to prove the harsh reality through their training. In contrast, Roman had already experienced the sensation of mana and could store it in his dention, the body's key center, thanks to the heavenly demon god art. However, Roman believed it was prudent to first learn the local methodology rather than rely solely on his common sense. He followed Chris's guidance, focusing on the rhythm of his breath and concentration. Chris explained that once Roman became accustomed to using mana, he could manifest an aura, signifying his elevation to a one-star knight. Oblivious to Chris's observation, Roman channeled energy into his palm and subsequently throughout his entire body. When Chris glanced at Roman, he was utterly flabbergasted to witness Roman already generating an aura, radiating a vibrant orange light that enveloped him. Chris was left speechless by the stunning display. Roman opened his eyes, convinced that the way Ki was employed in this world was impractical. He contemplated Miriam's Ki cultivation, which involved cleansing the meridians and accumulating Ki in the Dantian. In contrast, the world they were in hoped that mana would accumulate naturally, yet it dissipated from the body as quickly as it entered. Roman observed how their use of aura paralleled the exterior arts of Miram, which were designed to strengthen the exterior, but found it lacking. He recalled how Chris had diffused his mana throughout his body, a methodology he deemed inefficient. When Roman witnessed the vanishing aura in his palm, he couldn't help but doubt his path to becoming the strongest, feeling it might take more than a century to achieve. Meanwhile, Chris, equally stunned, inquired about Roman's mysterious feat. His voice filled with frustration, Chris reminded Roman that he had mastered the use of aura, which had originally secured his victory in their earlier duel. Roman responded with a chuckle which startled Chris. Chris questioned whether Roman found his struggle laughable, his fist clenched, ready to strike. Roman then probed Chris, asking if he had ever questioned his training techniques during his years of preparation. Chris froze, considering the question. Chris asked Roman to elaborate. Roman expressed his belief that many individuals tend to blindly trust methods that have endured for years, reflecting on his own doubts when learning energy from Chris. He wondered aloud why people clung to flawed methods whether out of ignorance or excessive faith in Captain Jonathan's teachings. Roman suggested that conformity was easier, providing protection from criticism. As they locked eyes, Roman found it intriguing that Chris had never questioned the imperfect approach. He bid farewell, but Chris halted him. Roman paused, waiting for Chris to speak. Chris turned to Roman and sought his guidance. Roman, recalling his past life and defeating the blood demon, felt a resemblance in Chris's current state of humility. When Roman looked into Chris's eyes, he saw that Chris had abandoned his pride, which brought a smile to Roman's face. Things were getting more interesting. Roman recollected how the Blood Demon, once a leader of the Blood Demon cult, had pledged loyalty to Young Hawk. However, before departing, the Blood Demon had one last question for Young Hyuk. How to become stronger? Chris's current mindset mirroring the moment when the blood demon roared at Jung Hyuk for guidance, reminded Roman of that encounter. Roman informed Chris that he wouldn't teach him to become stronger, but would provide answers if Chris stayed by his side. This puzzled Chris. Roman explained that he wanted Chris to observe him for the next six months as he battled numerous foes and grew stronger. If Chris remained with him for a decade, he would discover the answer. As day turned to night and moonlight streamed through the window, Chris pondered Roman's words alone in his room. 
He recalled every moment of his training until he achieved the rank of a two-star knight. Roman's comment about Chris never questioning the method resonated in his mind, further fueling his determination to find his own path. The following day, Chris surprised Jonathan by announcing his decision to accompany the young master to the battlefield. Jonathan was certain something significant had led to this choice. When he gazed into Chris's eyes and discerned the conviction behind his decision, Jonathan dismissed Chris from the Dimitri Knights and requested that he protect Roman in pursuit of his goals. Chris expressed his gratitude, and Jonathan recognized that Chris had grown into an independent adult, recalling the young boy he once comforted on a battlefield after losing his mother. Jonathan led Chris to his office, explaining the necessity of a secret tool for survival on the battlefield, which brought a smile to Chris's face as he followed Jonathan. Meanwhile, Kevin, who worked as a porter in the city, continued his labor. When he overheard people discussing Roman's solo victory over Blood Fang, a notorious gang leader, and the disbelief surrounding it due to Roman's noble status, Kevin was astounded. He couldn't fathom Roman's accomplishment. Memories of Roman effortlessly defeating their gang with a twig flooded Kevin's mind. Tears welled up in Kevin's eyes as he believed Roman had done it to fulfill his promise. He wiped away his tears and continued his work when his boss urged him to complete his tasks promptly. In the afternoon, as Kevin carried a box, he contemplated his desire to become stronger to protect his family. However, he remained unsure of how to achieve that strength and wished to meet Roman again. Suddenly, he heard someone calling his name. Looking up, he was shocked to see Roman standing before him. Kevin was speechless but quickly bowed to express his gratitude. Roman inquired about Kevin's well-being, and Kevin shared that Bloodfang had ceased threatening his family, thanks to Hans, who had helped him find a job. He didn't know how to adequately convey his gratitude. Roman then made Kevin an offer, assuring him that his family would face no further difficulties. They would enjoy prosperity and leisure activities. In return, Roman asked for Kevin's loyalty. Without hesitation, Kevin banged his head on the ground, pledging unwavering allegiance to Roman. Kevin declared that he would do anything Roman asked, even if it meant his own life. He believed Roman's promise to care for his family was more than sufficient. Kevin's display of loyalty, even to the point of drawing blood, reminded Roman of the Mad Demon, who would stand unwavering against countless adversaries on Jung Hyuk's command, ready to risk life and limb. Observing Kevin as he knelt before him, blood oozing from his head, Roman displayed a grin and declared that henceforth, Kevin was under his dominion. The following day, Roman escorted Kevin to the castle and entrusted his care to Hans. Roman encouraged Kevin to look after himself, and Kevin expressed his gratitude with a wide smile. Afterward, he informed Hans that he would be in the estate's library, making it a convenient location for Hans to find him. With that, they went their separate ways, and Hans took Kevin on a tour of the castle. Meanwhile, in the library, Roman sat at a desk piled high with books, delving into the topic of Aura Knights. To attain the status of a one star or one knight, the first step was to manifest Aura, and a two-star Aura Knight needed the ability to wield Aura for cutting steel. Progressing to a three-star or higher level elevated one to a realm beyond comprehension for most. These knights were treated with great distinction. On the Salamander continent, there existed a legendary six-star knight, and tales abounded of those who had yet to reach the coveted seven-star rank. Even among the top ten knights, only a select few achieved the status of six-star knights. As Roman continued to peruse the book, he contemplated the immense strength of these six-star knights and how they had attained such extraordinary abilities without using the key. His hand drifted toward another tome. This one focused on magicians. Archmages, those who had achieved the seventh circle in magic, were often perceived as half-human, half-god, or as living cataclysms. In groups, they wielded more destructive power than six-star aura soldiers with a single spell capable of devastating the earth and rending the sky. Roman recognized that, to advance further, he needed to bolster his strength. He resolved to commence his training in earnest. Closing the book, he acknowledged that these formidable individuals could become his adversaries at any moment. Leaning back and folding his arms, he pondered the inherent dangers and unpredictability of his path. He found solace in the knowledge that he could only truly be content when he was engaged in various activities and held dominion over them. Roman and Hans subsequently ventured to a workshop formerly utilized by Roman's father. 
Hans emphasized that the Baron had imposed strict prohibitions on outsiders entering the workshop, ensuring complete isolation from the outside world. Roman, upon entering the workshop, remarked that it was an ideal training space. He instructed Hans to maintain strict vigilance and prevent anyone from accessing the workshop for a week, unless there was a grave threat. Hans agreed to this solemn oath. Once Hans departed, Roman noticed a layer of straw on the floor and surmised that Hans had placed it there. Although appreciative, Roman recognized that it obstructed the flow of key and promptly gathered and stored it in a corner. Thus, Roman commenced his rigorous training regimen. Roman realized he had to begin with the foundational stages to employ the heavenly demon god arts as the basis for his arts. Taking a deep breath, he initiated the first step. Instantly, mana surged from his body, and he focused intently on purging all impure ki within him. Blood trickled from various parts of his face, but he persisted. The volume of impure ki within his body had taken him by surprise, but he had anticipated this challenge. He possessed just enough mana to return to his previous level of strength as swiftly as possible. His eyes also bled, but he remained resolute. He understood that with new relationships forged, he needed the power to protect them. A week later, Viscount Lawrence and Flora paid a visit to the Dimitris. The butler directed them to a waiting room and offered tea and snacks. Lawrence inquired about Roman, and the butler informed him that the master was currently attending to some business. He suggested they wait, then exited the room. Lawrence sensed that the Demetrius family was not entirely welcoming, but he chose to remain patient. He confided in Flora that he had organized this meeting to allow her an opportunity to rectify her previous error. Flora deeply regrets her choice to end her engagement due to her own selfishness, as it now places her family's territory in jeopardy. She vividly recalls the day she finally confided in her father, informing him that she had already announced her engagement and witnessing the immense anger it stirred within him. Her father reprimanded her while she explained her reasons for breaking off the marriage. He had never anticipated his daughter making such a thoughtless decision. He took the opportunity to remind Flora that the Barcos had withdrawn a substantial sum from the gold bank for their impending war, putting their territory at risk. Sitting down, the Viscount earnestly conveyed to Flora that the Demetrius family represented their sole chance against the formidable Barcos, given their wealth and power. Flora, however, adamantly opposed her father's perspective, asserting that the Lawrences were not so feeble that they had to rely on the Demetrius. Her father sighed, and in a more solemn tone, informed Flora that he had matured over time. He also conveyed that there might be a glimmer of hope if it were merely a dispute between two families. Nonetheless, the Barcos enjoyed the backing of the central government, and the bank had extended them a loan without collateral, indicating a deeper entanglement. Furthermore, her father explained that it would be a conflict they were unlikely to win. He foresaw the Barcos stripping the Lawrences of everything, motivated by a cause they vehemently championed. This grim realization weighed heavily on Flora's conscience as she reflected on her ill-conceived actions. She felt an overwhelming sense of guilt for her selfish behavior, making it difficult for her to meet her father's gaze. She sternly admonished herself to grow up and face her responsibilities as an adult. Outside the workshop, Hans paced anxiously, his thoughts consumed by Roman's prolonged absence. He remained concerned about the Viscount of Lawrence and Flora, who had been waiting since morning, unsure of whether to enter or not. Then the workshop door swung open unexpectedly, revealing Roman's presence and catching Hans off guard. Meanwhile, Lawrence and Flora continued to wait, long after their tea had gone cold. Lawrence understood that Flora's actions had put them in this predicament and steeled himself to endure the silent treatment. He recognized that their family's salvation hinged on a strategic political marriage. As Lawrence grappled with his growing frustration, he abruptly stood up, signaling his departure to find Baron Dimitri himself. Meanwhile in his office, Romero was engrossed in his work. The sound of footsteps outside his door interrupted his concentration. Lawrence stormed into the office, venting his frustration about the extended waiting time. He expressed disbelief at the uncharacteristic discourtesy displayed by Demetrius. Romero, maintaining his composure, dipped his pen into the inkwell and calmly pointed out that today's meeting had not been scheduled. He mentioned that they had informed Roman of their intention to meet a week earlier, but Roman had declined. 
Nevertheless, the Lawrences had arrived despite the absence of a confirmed appointment. Romero acknowledged that he could not deny their presence, and inquired if Lawrence wished to discuss the extended waiting period. The shocking revelation followed, as Romero disclosed that Roman had terminated the engagement with Flora during her visit to Dimitri, even though Lawrence had confronted him. He recognized Flora's involvement in the decision, but chose not to hold the Lawrences accountable. Lawrence remained silent, acknowledging the validity of Romero's statements. Flora, head bowed in shame, grasped the gravity of their predicament.